Baltimore City Council Budget and Appropriations Committee. We're here for Council Bill 20-0527, Ordinance of Estimates for the Fiscal Year Ending June 30, 2021. I am Councilman Eric Costello from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee. We are joined by Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilman Leon Pinkett from the 7th District, Council Vice President Sharon Green Middleton from the 6th District, Councilman Isaac Yitzi Schleifer from the 5th District, Councilman Chris Burnett from the 8th District, Councilman Ryan Dorsey from the third district. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Nina Themelis and Matt Stegman on behalf of Mayor Jack Young. In addition, we are joined by Keelan Young, Dominic McAlilly, and uh, Rebecca Simmons from Council President Brandon Scott's office. Uh, staff to the committee is Marguerite Curran. We are here for our state's attorney's office. Uh, we have with us in chambers, uh, uh, Madam State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby. Uh, Madam State's Attorney, uh, floor is yours to uh, start. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice President, um, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the Budget and Appropriations Committee. Let me start by reminding this body of the mission of the Office of the State's Attorney for Baltimore City, which is to safeguard communities through the effective prosecution of crime. Justice is the only barometer of success for our office, which is why our prosecutors are sworn to aggressively pursue justice over convictions in every single case. Sometimes, as we have put on our website and have re-emphasized with our staff, sometimes justice requires a conviction, a lengthy prison sentence, but other times justice requires dropping all charges or diverting a defendant out of the criminal justice system to drug rehabilitation, education, or job training. In this pursuit, we have not been without our fair share of challenges as it relates to Baltimore's crime fight and restoring faith in our local criminal justice system. But my office has met those challenges with triumph and remained steadfast in our commitment to accountability, professionalism, and transparency. These values are the keys to unlocking a future where community confidence in the criminal justice system is restored, violent repeat offenders are held accountable, and our communities feel safe again. As we continue to address the public safety challenges in our city, we ask that you pass our budget with the addition of the 13 defunded positions um, lost as a result of the citywide savings initiative. I'm grateful for your support and as, as my prosecutors continue to work tirelessly with police and other public safety partners to combat the current crime increase. Following my, open, my opening remarks, my chief of administration, Camille Blakefall, will answer any specific questions uh, regarding the proposed fiscal year 21 budget, but I'd like to use my time this morning to provide you with a top level view of how we've prioritized spending in my office to more effectively prosecute perpetrators of senseless crime, better serve victims and witnesses, and run a more efficient and effective administration, administrative operation. So if we can start with the first slide, please. Is it up? Okay, great. The prosecution of criminals across Baltimore City is a priority for our agency with a recommended 36,486,892 allotted in the fiscal year 2020 budget for this effort. This includes $11,369,783 in grant dollars that funds 36 of the SAO's most experienced prosecutors who staff the Homicide Major Investigations Gun Violence Enforcement Division and the Charging Unit, 11 law clerks and support staff, and 24 victim witness advocates. Ultimately, city funding is not keeping pace with the demand on our prosecutors. Nonetheless, as state's attorney, my top priorities have been targeting violent repeat offenders, building the public's trust in law enforcement, and running a transparent and accountable administration. Since 2015, we've successfully convicted every public enemy number one, with the exception of two individuals. Collectively, their sentences include six life sentences plus 700 years in prison. Over the past year, my talented and dedicated assistant state's attorneys continued to zealously prosecute cases and fight on behalf of all victims and witnesses of crime. Some highlights include a 75-year sentence, conviction and sentence for Keon Gray, a repeat violent offender that took the life of seven-year-old Taylor Hayes, a 65-year-old sentence, a 65-year sentence and conviction for high-ranking black guerrilla family gang affiliate Roderick King, who was convicted of attempted first-degree murder, first-degree assault, armed carjacking, armed robbery, and use of a firearm and a crime of violence, life plus 40 years sentence for the killer of 18-month-old Zarai Gray, Francois Brown. Brown was convicted of second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. The Felony Trial and Special Victims Unit closed the year with 90% and a 96% conviction rate, respectively. My Conviction Integrity Unit, which is one of only three in the state and the oldest in the state, has exonerated nine men under my tenure and five in the past year alone. 
These men served the combined 250 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. The fiscal year 21 budget includes funding for eight new ASA positions uh, totaling approximately $1.1 million for the four Baltimore City Community Intelligence Centers. There are district level operation centers that will use data analysis, technology, interagency collaboration, and case management to formulate holistic interventions for sustainable crime prevention and response. These centers will bring together police officers, assistant state attorneys, civilian analysts, and case managers to create, disseminate, and receive intelligence quickly and efficiently. Additionally, funding is allocated and allotted for two analysts to join the BSIC teams, but these positions will be transferred from, to BPD and will no, will not, no longer be a part of our office's personnel. And finally, funding is included to support lab testing and expert analysis of THC content per Maryland's 2019 hemp marijuana law, since it is now required. We can go to slide two, please. Service 781, the service funds the administrative, technological, and human resource resources and policy and legislative affairs work of my office with the recommended 7.6 million going to support these efforts. The funding provided under this service also assists in maintaining and improving information systems to support all of the SAO's initiatives, as well as supporting the personnel and technology needs related to body-worn camera video review. Last year, my body-worn camera division within the past year has uploaded and has spent approximately 45,500 hours reviewing more than 92,748 videos. The MIS services, the graphic, technical, hardware, software, and network information systems needed for almost 406 employees. MIS over the past year has had its own set of unprecedented challenges, which includes, which includes the city's malware ransomware uh, attack in 2019 and now moving many of the SAO's activities virtually and remotely in light of the global pandemic of COVID-19. Our MIS staff work 24-7 monitoring notifications and vulnerabilities of the city network and BPD network operations to anticipate further defensive actions. We can move to slide three. Service 786. In Baltimore City, victim and witness services are paramount to any successful prosecution strategy. We are the home of the stop snitching mentality and culture, and I recognize the tremendous amount of work that we all need to do to break down the barriers of distrust that exist among communities and law enforcement. Therefore, the 4.5 million of exactly $4,522,471 is recommended to fund full-time personnel who assist victims and witnesses of crime in Baltimore City by providing counseling and guidance, notification of rights, and support in court and monetary resources and reimbursement where needed. In 2019, the state attorney's office provided services to 11,387 victims, witnesses, and their families relocated <clears throat> 286 victims and offered 797 counseling sessions to families of homicide victims, which is 20 times the number of victims served since the start of my administration. For witnesses of crime determined to be at risk of intimidation or retribution, the division provides relocation assistance, temporary and permanent new housing, and other limited forms of financial support, including vouchers for food and travel expenses. In an effort to combat witness intimidation in fiscal year 2020, the state attorney's office created a multi-platform platform victim witness campaign to create awareness of the multitude of services provided by our office to victims and witnesses of crime in Baltimore City, reassuring the community that we are here for them during the entire criminal justice process from the very beginning to the very end and beyond. I would note that through our bereavement center, uh, which is the only bereavement center in the state of Maryland, we offer lifetime grief counseling. We intend to expand this campaign in 2020. Recognizing that our role as prosecutors isn't exclusive to a courtroom. With the creation of the Policy and Legislative Affairs Division, we've been able to make a great deal of headway, not only in the courtroom, but also in Annapolis. This past legislative session, we successfully lobbied for the passage of numerous bills, many of which even with the shortened session passed. This included the passage of HB 40 and SB 64, forfeiture by wrongdoing, HB 637, courts, discovery in custody, witness testimony, partial expungement, possession of marijuana records, and hate crime basis. Last but certainly not least, I'd also like to touch upon our efforts to not only serve city youth in the prevention of violence, but to take a holistic approach to the prosecution of crime in a city where 22% of Baltimore's population lives in poverty and 35 
excuse me, 33 percent of children are living below poverty. We recognize that we need to get to young people before they get to the criminal justice system, and we continue to invest in our limited resources in youth programming. Since the creation of the youth coordinator position in Crime Control and Prevention Division, we've seen and been able to interact with over 6,790 youth participants through our various programs, which is a 5,605% increase from the start of my administration. Our junior state's attorney program started in 2015, exposing eighth and ninth graders to careers in the criminal justice system has welcomed 219 participants since its inception. We partnered with the mayor's office of employment development through youth works for the past two years, and we'll be doing so this year as well by way of virtual programming. Also this past school year, Great Expectations, which introduces fourth grade students to careers in the criminal justice system has touched more than 430 students and expanded its footprint to three schools, Sharp Leadenhall Elementary, Dorothy Heights Elementary, and Utah Mashburn. Lastly, our Baltimore pop-up series, which started in 2017, has provided alternative out activities for over 7,500 of Baltimore's youth and families every Friday evening during the summer times between the hours of six and nine when we've seen a drastic increase in violence. We will continue the pop-up programs which are slated to begin on July 3rd, but we will be doing them and conducting them virtually. As you can see, we've had a very busy year and although we are a comparatively small city agency, we're tasked with an enormous amount of responsibility. I can tell you that 90% of our budget is comprised of personnel costs, where almost a quarter of our personnel are grant funded. In fiscal year 2020, my office obtained 24 grants totaling over 11.3 million in grant funding. This funding includes for an astonishing total of 84 positions within the office. If and when grant funds are discontinued or become unavailable, we will be forced to reduce staffing at a time when crime rate, the crime rate and record caseloads in our office are already challenging. It's imperative that we stop relying on grant funds to fund almost a quarter of the staff, including our most experienced and most valuable attorneys, such as those operating the war room instead of these positions. Instead, these positions need to be funded by general funds. But Madam, State's, is, Madam State's Attorney, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I need sure. to step out. Uh, Vice Chair Pinkett, if you could chair, please, and thank you. Sorry, Madam State's Attorney, no please problem. proceed. Funding these positions in the general funds only ensures that my office is able to continue to do what it's been tasked to do in the pursuit of our mission to safeguard communities in Baltimore City. So unless you have any additional questions for me, I will now turn things over to Ms. Blake Fall, my Chief of Administration, for a more detailed presentation of our fiscal year 20 budget. Additionally, I have other members of my team available to assist in answering any specific questions you may have, including each of my deputies, um, Chief Deputy State's Attorney Michael Schatzel, Chief of External Affairs Nicole harris Cress, Deputy of Major Crimes Patricia DeMeo, Deputy of Criminal Intelligence Janice Bledsoe, Deputy of Operations Valda Ricks, Chief of Information, um, the MIS, which is Darren O'Brien, and Chief of Victim and Witness Services Arcelia Green, in addition to every single one of my division chiefs, if there are, in fact, any sort of questions pertaining to the presentation. With that, I would turn it over to Thank you, Madam State's Attorney. You've covered most everything um, outlined in our fiscal 21 budget. I would note that we are basically just three, we've received a 3% increase across the board from our budget last year. Um, incremental, everybody's making cuts, we're making cuts as well. Our general fund dollars for personnel have stayed flat over the past three years. Um, but we are um, appreciative of the funds we've received to support the work in our administration um, service, as well as the work in our um, prosecution of criminal service. So if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to, to talk you through uh, the budget numbers or the staffing numbers. Thank you. And I'm quite sure there, there'll be plenty of questions. And so my, my first question, and I, and I believe that I'm asking this on behalf, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I believe that I maybe asking this on behalf of all of my colleagues, is that um, I know that it's been discussed um, at length by myself and Chairman Costello on a number of occasions, but um, I'm, I'm, st I'm still not quite understanding um, why enti uh, any entity that receives public dollars is allowed to come before the council 
and not be held to performance measures like any other body um, in their expenditure of taxpayer dollars. And what I'm talking about is that in our, in our budget books, there typically are some sort of performance measures that we can use um, to you know, measure the, just like it says, measure the performance of the, the agency, the entity that's requesting uh, taxpayer dollars. And so um, one, can you speak to why um, there aren't? And two, um, can we get you know, the state's attorney's office to work with BBMR to identify performance measures that can be used to hold um, the state's attorney's office accountable? So first and foremost, the performance measures that are set out in the other city agencies are defined by the mayor. As you are aware, I'm a separately elected official. So I set the performance measures for my office, which would not be in line with another elected position or office. So I, I will, we do have performance measures that we set. And if you'd like, we've gone through this I, for the past couple of years. We, we can essentially tell you what it is that we do and what we measure. Um, so our obligation as outlined in the annual budget is to public safety. So we meet our overall objective. We work with our law enforcement partners in the city to achieve success. We do so while maintaining our obligation to be good fiscal stewards. Um, but the overall objective our, of our office is to achieve our goal of doing justice in every individual case. We evaluate personnel annual, annually. We observe people in court and in the office. We keep track of how many cases are being diverted to our problem-solving courts. We review how much body-worn camera footage is being reviewed and by whom and um, by who. Uh, we evaluate how many cases are being handled by people in the office and what outcomes of those cases uh, generate. We review information on how well we're doing, um, measured not just by our conviction rates published on our website and our annual report, but we also use our diversion program and we assess whether or not each of our individual prosecutors are meeting the performance measures that we set internally. So we have a performance evaluation process that we do each and every year. Um, and it's a, we base our, our, our merit increases based upon those performance evaluations. I, I can get into some of the questions that, it, and we've provided a copy of those evaluation forms to the, to the city council in the past, but we can do so again. No, I, I appreciate that. And so, I mean, that that's informative. So uh, the the incoming council, council moving forward, will know that if there aren't performance measures in the budget book, it is not the result of the state's attorney's office not willing to provide them. It's the mayor's office not asking for them. Well, it's not necessarily about the, the mayor's office not asking for them. The mayor sets their own standards of performance evaluation or, 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 or metrics, right? And we're not... We don't have to go, our performance measures are not gonna be based upon the mayoral administration. They're gonna be based upon the needs and the goals of our office. So we have our own internal performance metrics that we set, and that's what we're willing to provide for you all. Got it. So we, we, would, we would love to see those. Absolutely. Um, um, my, my, my next question, um, and it, well, today marks an anniversary that um, you know no, families should uh, even have to um, acknowledge. Uh, it, it marks the, the third anniversary of the brutal murder of Charmaine Wilson, um, who was slain in front of um, her eight children. And um, in a city where, you know, we have over 300 murders and um, you would think, you know, a person like Charmaine, she becomes forgotten easily. And the, the reason that um, I remember Charmaine is that because I stood with her family on at least two occasions where um, they were in court and didn't get justice. And so first and foremost, I want to commend uh, your staff that works with uh, families and works with witnesses. Um, I saw their hearts broken along with the family as they sit in court over and over trying to seek justice. But having said that, um, I, I do want to know if and getting some of the data that we requested earlier, can we also get data on, on the numbers of shootings, numbers of carjackings, and numbers of homicides in the city? And how many of those, and, and, and I guess break it down in these particular areas, how many are charged? And then what is the disposition of those 
those particular incidents or cases? Are they indicted or are those cases dropped? Um, I, I've never seen any data that really lays out for us, you know, the total numbers and then, you know, whatever, whatever happens with those cases. And so is that information that we can get as a council? So it's absolutely um, information that you can get as a council. And I would even point to the um, data that the police department puts out with reference to the clearance rate on shootings and mm -hmm. on non-fatal shootings. Um, I'm pulling up the data right now, but I can point you to the clearance rate um, just right now as of uh, today, I believe that the overall clearance rate in the non-fatal shootings is uh, year to date this year, about 16%. And I mean, well, cumulative 22%, mm -hmm. right? Um, homicides, let me just be clear on that one. I don't want to misquote anything. Cumulative, we're looking at approximately 38%. So I think what you'll see based upon that is we work hand in hand, hand in glove with the police department in these investigations, but a number of these, the, the, the clearance rate is not all that great. And so that's one of the reasons why we launched the campaign that we did last year around victim witness services, right? To be able to understand and recognize that it can't just be on the police department. It can't just be on my prosecutors who are getting in here and zealously advocating every single day. The most important stakeholder at the end of the day, when you have seven-year-old being shot in broad daylight or an 89-year-old getting killed and nobody wants to come forward, the most important stakeholder in the criminal justice system is the community. And so what we've attempted to do is to be able to provide whatever services are needed and re required of the community in, in order for them to feel confident about solving these types of cases. When you have a, a, a clearance rate that is as that low, and I know that oftentimes we want to point the finger at police, we want to point the finger at my office, but at the end of the day, as a community, we have to understand and recognize that there are more of us individuals that want to change the trajectory of our communities than there are of the small number of individuals that define that negative perception. And that can't happen if people aren't willing to come forward. And so I think that's the importance of, you know, ensuring when I talked about those grant funded positions, we got this additional money through the VOCA funds so that we could get victim witness advocates in every single one of our divisions to be able to work with victims and witnesses of crime. That's the reason why we launched that campaign you're not alone. Together, we're stronger. We're providing relocation services. We'll provide you bilingual support. We'll provide you, you know, the ability to do in-court statements and um, victim impact statements. We will help you. And that was the point is because we really have to emphasize at the end of the day, we cannot do our job if people are unwilling and uh, to come forward and to assist us. And, 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 and a lot of that sometimes falls on the community who want to feel like they're going to be protected, which I, again is one of the reasons why we, we're going to expand upon the campaign that we started last year. Right. And, and I don't want to get in, into any particular case. And that's why I brought up the case of Charmaine Wilson. I, I had the opportunity to really see in an intimate way um, how we could have done a better job of, of securing, identifying um, you know, witnesses and, and giving them the assurance and protection that they needed long before. Um, it, I, I witnessed a system where we didn't provide any protection to witnesses until like days before the court case. And that was way too long. The, 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 the negative uh, factors in, the, in, in this particular case got to those witnesses way before we did. And it, and it works against us being able to get convictions on, on cases like this. So that, that was the reason why I brought that up. And, um, and I hope that there's much more work that we can do in that particular area because um, the, the, the clearance rate has to become higher because criminals understand, unfortunately, right. that um, if you commit a crime in Baltimore, there is a high probability that you might get away with it. And that, that cannot be the, the reputation of our city. Um, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Shannon Sneed. Thank you. My question is just around, I, I know in the past that um, there was you were saying you're, you're not going to prosecute any marijuana cases. And I just wanted to see how that has been going and how much money and resources you've saved um, by not going after those low offenses. 
So we get data around this and my my deputy, chief deputy is actually on the call. He can give you specifics around the marijuana. Actually, if he if he doesn't have it, I can get you that. But we've seen a drastic sort of decrease um, in arrests. Uh, and essentially, the police department aren't making arrests on marijuana. And then we had the whole hemp issue that came up last year and the testing issue. Um, so in essence, we are we're not we're no longer um, utilizing those resources. And when I say resources, you, you got to consider, you know, not only would you are you taking time to arrest an individual and you have the resources of the police officer, that person would have to be booked. They go through the central booking staff. They would then have to be set onto a uh, district court docket. That is the resources of the courts, the resources of the public defender. We then would have to use the resources of the Baltimore Police Department in order to test um, these, whether or not it's marijuana, um, which they can no longer even, well, they do not any longer do. Um, and then the resources of having the prosecutor evaluate the case, the resources of having to call witnesses for your case. If, if in fact the officer is, is not working, it's considered overtime to have to bring them into court. Um, so there were a number of resources, as I, I indicated when I uh, decided that we weren't gonna be prosecuting marijuana, there was no and is no public safety value um, in doing so. It was extremely counterproductive to the limited resources we have. We just saw, we just discussed all of the resources that it takes just to prosecute one marijuana case. Um, and then when we consider the needs of our city, which Councilman Pinkett has already brought up so eloquently, like victim witness services and a clearance rate last year, overall homicide clearance rate of 26%, right? Those expended resources it should be um, put upon various and other divisions. I can tell you that as a direct result of us no longer prosecuting uh, marijuana, we were able to redistribute some of our personnel out of the district court. Um, and we have been able to staff up completely some of our other more serious crime divisions like our homicide division. Um, but the data suggests that again, it hasn't, it, it, it's just, and and then the last, but certainly not least, I think one of the the most um, incremental, the instrumental sort of reasons why we did what we did is that we knew and we understood, even in 2019, that these laws were being discriminately enforced against poor Black and Brown people, um, even with, in essence, issuing the citations. Um, you know, 42% of the citations that were being issued citywide we're going in one out of nine police districts which happens to be um councilman pinkett's district which was the district is which is 95 percent black and, and and disproportionately impoverished so we were um we stand by our decision um and as you all may be aware um you know there were a number of racial justice issues um, resource issues, public safety issues as to why we arrived at that determination. But I can give you the actual numbers. If I don't know if Michael Schatzow has the ability of, of remoting in, if he doesn't have them on hand, I can get them to you. Thank you, thank you. The other question I wanted to know, I know there was back and forth with the governor and you asking for resources if he really wanted to make a difference. Did you guys ever get to a conclusion of getting those resources that we need here in the city to make a difference? So, um, yes, I, I did go back and forth uh, with the governor. He was proposing to create a mini um, state's attorney's office out of the attorney general's office um, in this past legislative session. Um, we, in essence, I went to the governor and I asked that he utilize and use those resources towards um, programs such as Safe Streets and a more holistic sort of approach. Um, we also asked at that time, the, the Baltimore Intelligence Centers were being created. I had the awesome opportunity of going out to Chicago. The mayor, um, Jack Young, has gone out as well as the commissioner. And one of the things that we were asking for was support around um, the, the personnel costs 
associated and attributable to those 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 centers. As you're aware, initially what we were requesting was that we would have these centers in every single police district. So we would have nine of them. As a result of the COVID and the deficit that we're facing, I believe that we're now only slated for four of those those um, B6. And as I indicated in my comments, this is an opportunity to cohabitate. And I can't underestimate, I, 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 I can't overemphasize the importance of cohabitating um, with your colleagues when it comes to these issues, right? When it comes to crime, data analytics, attorneys, um, police officers, and then also having the health department be a part of that as well and, and, and ensuring that we're providing responsive services to the community. So that was the request. Um, I, I do believe that it, it's, been, uh, it's been put on hold um, and there were some modifications that were made to the state budget, but I believe that all of that as in light of COVID has been put, uh, is, there's a freeze on it. Thank you, uh, those are my two questions. Thank you. Vice President Middleton. You want those numbers now? Oh, yes, please. Yes. Oh, yeah, if you have them, yeah. Yeah, this is Mike Schatz. So um, for calendar year 2019, we now processed 174 marijuana cases that were charged by the police um, without going through our office. There are probably another roughly 60 marijuana cases that they brought to the central uh, booking facility, which we would have dismissed right there before people even go through processing. And then, of course, that does not include all of the marijuana cases that the police don't arrest because they know we're not going to prosecute them. We don't have any statistics on that. But that, that would add to the savings that you were referring to because um, while the police started out initially continuing to arrest and some arrests continue to get made, they are uh, dramatically lower than what they used to be. But, but do you have from a, a state's attorney's office the, the amount of savings that you all experienced? Uh, right. No, we've, I, I think Mrs. Mosby actually um, accurately articulated the various buckets where the savings occur but I, I do not believe that we have calculated to the dollar what those savings add up to. And I would just note that it's not, again, as I indicated, it's not just a savings from a, a perspective of the state's attorney's office. Um, it's a savings from the criminal justice system overall, because when you make an arrest um, or a, a attempt to, to obtain a conviction for these types of offenses, Right. It has implications on the public defender's office. It has implications on the courts. It has implications on DPS, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. So to try to calculate that is, is, is somewhat difficult. I can tell you, as I stated before, we've been able to redistribute our attorneys into some of our more serious divisions as a direct result of not having to, to deal with as many of those um, low, lower level offenses. Right, and if I might, Councilwoman Sneed, uh, I mean, and I don't disagree with those those other savings that are experienced in the other aspects of the criminal justice system. But I, I would think at the at the minimum, you could look to the prior year and see how many uh, staff hours were dedicated to marijuana cases, and then put a dollar amount on the fact that you aren't having to commit that amount of staff time to marijuana cases anymore. I, I, I thought at the minimum we could get that. I mean, at the minimum, I mean, we just said that 174 cases we had the year before we had this policy. We know that uh, from the basic salary or entry level salary of a district court prosecutor is 68,700 and something starting salary. So, I mean, we can break that down for you and we can send that to you if, if you'd like. Would that, would that be satisfactory, uh, Councilman Snead? Sure, yeah, that's fine, thank you. Vice President Middleton. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pinkett. Uh, my, my statement is more on uh, basically comments. Um, I just want to, you know, my hat off to you as a, um, a colleague, um, African American female leading a, a um, organization that is always needed in this city. Um, you know, I'm looking at the perspective of the outreach 
and the social justice that you have always been on the forefront with um, as far as our city is, concern, is concerned, you have um, uh, community liaisons in, in just about every area of this entire city. You have your um, court in the community um, that you give throughout um, the city. I, I know you've been in my area at uh, the Zeta Center. It's always a well-packed, informative thing you have um, your family bereavement center that um, you know it helps people. You you know I could continue to go down the list of how your outreach and marketing and helping people has just been really on on top, and it almost puts the Baltimore City Police Department to shame of uh, with that particular kind of outreach because we continue to try to push community policing with the police department, but yet you're, with the funds that you get, you really do that outreach in, in teaching and, and bringing, uh, trying to bring people together and help. And we're at, we're in this era where we, we those are things that are needed right now with the type of fundings that you get. you. You, you've done some positive things like exonerate um, someone that has been in jail um, for 25 years. Just think of those, those kind of things where you have basically saved people's lives. So um, on that note, you know, my hat off to you. Continue, you. you and your team continue to do those kind of things. That's what's important right now, especially what's going on with um, Black Lives Matter and the thing, the problems that happened with, um, not just with um, George Floyd, but you know, we have had similar problems and cases like this throughout our city. And in my belief, those are the things that are on the top of the list. And I am so glad that your office is on the forefront with those. So, um, you continue to have my support um, and and thank you for everything. I know it's a team effort and this is a very hard uh, city for that working on social justice. So again, I thank you. No, and thank you, Councilwoman. I really I appreciate no, that. And I have no questions. I just want to say thank you, Councilwoman. I, I appreciate your sentiments. I know that my team work extremely hard. Um, I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish um, in, despite unprecedented sort of challenges. If we think about what we've been through in the past five years, um, from the uprising following the untimely death of, of Freddie Gray to the Department of Justice report exposing the discriminatory policing practices of the eighth largest police department in the country to the full implementation of body worn cameras um, to having to deal with and also clean up the one of the largest police corruption scandals in the history of the country where officers were in essence planting guns and drugs on 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 citizens uh, I, I having to work with five police commissioners in in three years as well as um, soon to be and congratulations um, Mr. President, Brandon Scott, if he is on, um, now going to be five five mayors in, in the past five years. So um, I, I just want to, again, thank you for your sentiments, but it's it's you're only as good as the people you have around you. And I am grateful for an awesome team that understand the importance of the work that we do every day. Right. Thank you. That's all I have. OK. Thank you, Vice President Middleton. Uh, Councilman Slifer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam State's Attorney, I want to thank you and your team for the work that you guys continue to do in my district. Um, as I mentioned uh, last year during budget hearings, um, the attention to detail that you guys place and really following through on uh, priority cases in the community has had a great impact. And the community appreciates that that after writing uh, many impact statements that they actually see follow up and they actually see action taken and it gives them um, hope that um, if they continue to be engaged like you're mentioning um, in the beginning of your presentation that they will see results and uh, we can undoubtedly say that in priority um, 
you know, when there's priority cases that your office uh, certainly does respond to the community and make sure that um, their voices are heard and that that's communicated to the judge. So thank you for that. I have no other questions. Thank you, Councilman Schleifer. And I would just say thank you for your support. I know that last year we had a case in which you were able to galvanize your community and, and provide hundreds of um, community impact statements. And it did not result in the way that we wanted, but it did bring attention um, to the bench and to those particular judges. And change did in, act, in, in all actuality happen as a direct result of your efforts um, and your engagement. So thank you for your leadership. Yeah, and the uh, members of the bench are still talking about it, so. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Slifer. Councilman Dorsey. Councilman Dorsey. Before I go back to Chairman Costello, did I miss any members of the committee or other council persons that are on the uh, virtual call with us today? Chairman Costello, I have one other question, but I'll defer to you at this at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have any questions. I just have a comment, Madam State's Attorney. Uh, I want to thank all the hardworking uh, attorneys in your office that are doing great work, uh, and especially for uh, their engagement uh, in the community after the fact of a crime. Um, I think it's uh, important that our residents uh, get to a place uh, where they see that uh, police are not the only entity or agency that are dealing with crime in the city uh, and that, and that it, it should and can be a, a team effort. So I want to thank your attorneys, Madam State's Attorney. Thank uh, you. Chair, uh, Chairman Pickett, I go back to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Madam State's Attorney. There, there, there was a, a report recently by the Able Foundation, I think, on uh, mm -hmm. juveniles being, um, uh, I guess, charged with uh, adult crimes or certain adult crimes. You know, and so um, I, I think, and I could be wrong, I think a, um, a position of your office has been to, you know, mandatory charge certain juvenile crimes as an adult. Can you talk about how that's going and, you know, where we are with uh, juveniles being charged as adults? So, and I just will point, and I can provide you all of the recent data. I don't have it in front of me, but we okay. put this and publish this online every single, um, we do it on a biweekly basis. But what I can tell you based upon the ABLE Foundation report, which was not news to us, um, we have been, and statutorily, the way that it works if, is if you are charged as a juvenile with crimes that have a life sentence, so, you know, your murders, your first degree assaults, your armed carjackings, your armed robberies, right? These are violent offenses. And you can be either 14 if it's a murder and depending on the enumerated offense or higher, you automatically, we have no authority as, as you are automatically charged as an adult, right? In the adult system. And what we recognize is that the two systems are very different. The juvenile system focuses on rehabilitation. The adult system focuses on retribution. But if you commit one of those offenses and you're charged at a certain age, 14 and up, you're going to be charged automatically in the adult system. The, the respondents, that's what they're called. They're not necessarily called defendants in the juvenile system. But the defendants in the adult system, as they're charged, right, they have the ability to petition the court based upon several sort of factors, the age of the child, the size of the child, the amenability of the child to certain offenses, the nature of the offense, right? They can petition the court to say, this child should not be in adult court. We want to waive this child back down to juvenile court. And what we've seen, and my prosecutors can get up there and we will argue those five elements. And we do argue these five elements to say why in this particular case, this child should be sent or this child should not be sent. This, this child, as a result of those five factors, should remain in adult court. What we've seen, and I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I promise you I can get them, is that last year, I believe there was a 70 76% of the cases that started in adult court were petitioned back down to juvenile, okay? And what I can tell you is that a majority of those offenses, a, a, a majority of those cases, we were making a recommendation for them not to be waived back down based upon those five factors. 
And so what the ABLE Foundation report shows is that same sort of data. And in one instance, one particular judge, in every single one of those cases that he came across, he was making a determination, despite our objection, in 100% of the cases to send those children back. When you look at the data from 2014 to current year data, what we've seen is like a drastic sort of increase in the number of children that are start in adult court that are being waved back down. And I believe, and I don't want to say the wrong number, but I believe there was like a 43% increase when you look at 2014 to current year data. Does that make sense? It, it does. And so um, once they are waved back down to juvenile, um, how are we doing in, in helping, uh, you know, with the, the resources and services and I know it goes beyond your office, but to, to really, um, you know, if, if, if we're not, if we don't have them in the adult, you know, court, if we put them back down, it's, it's restorative. So how, how are we helping to restore these young people so that, you know, they don't, you know, end up, you know, participating in crime? And so I believe is Don on this call. Don is my division chief for the division, um, for the juvenile division. Don Walter, are you on the call? Anyone? All right. Yeah, Michael Shatzow, did you want to touch to this? Madam State Attorney, are you there? Oh, you there? There he we is. There's hear, John Walter. <laughs> I knew he was around. He's always around. Yes. Um, so can you speak to some of the services and how sometimes uh, we have no control over the Department of Juvenile Services? We work with them, even um, pre-trial to ensure that we're diver diverting youth. But if you can speak to Councilman Pinkett's question around when those juveniles are transferred back that are originally charged as adults, what typically happens? Uh, yes, Madam State Attorney. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, the Primarily what happens with those individuals that come back uh, from the adult system, uh, usually because of the nature of the charges and the, you know, the factors that go into the decision that we make, if we, if we opposed transfer, uh, those individuals will usually end up with a commitment recommendation, uh, meaning that we're recommending they be committed to the department. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the recommendation is for placement. There is commitment within the community. Uh, what that looks like is they essentially become, uh, the state becomes their guardian um, if they remain in the community and it's like a stepped up probation. Uh, they get the, the most services that DJS has available. Uh, usually in transfer cases, because the individuals are a little older, uh, more often than not, they have a record of some kind and a record of involvement with the system and some form of treatment. Uh, and because those cases are the cases that implicate public safety at the highest level, they're usually firearms, offenses, uh, crimes of violence, et cetera. Uh, those individuals uh, are often looking at being placed um, Juvenile Services makes those, that, that determination. Uh, so all the court can say with our recommendation is commitment for play, uh, they're committed to the department either in the community uh, or for placement or placed on probation if we're successful and they're found tax sustained. Uh, from there, the Department of Juvenile Services will staff those individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll look at their background, uh, their you know, community situation, their family situation, and we'll try to match them up with the best services and the best placement available, uh, be that within the state uh, or out of state. Uh, and right now, you know, given the circumstances with uh, COVID, that's becoming extremely difficult because most of the placements are either not accepting uh, new respondents uh, or they're simply closed at this time. Uh, so it's, it's one of our, our huge challenges right now, and we're hopeful that within the next few months, a lot of those placements will open back up uh, because they are an excellent tool to help you know, break the, the people, places, and things, and to help provide those the more intensive services uh, for the deeper end individuals who are oftentimes transferred back. No, thank, thank you for that information. That's extremely helpful. Um, and it's, you know, obviously we need more resources, but it's good to hear that uh, there's a process and resources available for those young people. Um, I want to go back through my colleagues just to see if there are any subsequent questions or if there's anyone that I may have missed. Um, Vice President Middleton, did I see you raise your hand? 
Uh, no, I'm good. Thank oh, okay. you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Sneed. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, just checking back through Councilman Slifer. I'm good. No further questions. Okay. If you would just be patient with me, just to just looking through the list to make certain. I see Councilman Dorsey lo logged in, checking again. Councilman Dorsey, did you have any questions? Um, before I recess this meeting, I want to give an opportunity for um, Marguerite. Is Councilman Costello uh, still available and in chambers? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. He's not here, but he should be back momentarily. Madam State's Attorney, if you could just be patient with me for just a, a moment. Um, being yes. Councilman Costello is the chair of this committee, I want to at least give him an opportunity to give us the direction on the, the next steps. But I think that um, if he doesn't come back in the next minute or so, I'll go ahead and recess it. But um, does anybody know any songs they want to sing? <laughs> okay. So being that there aren't any further questions, this uh, committee is now in recess until 530. Madam State's Attorney, thank you for uh, all the work that you and your team are doing on behalf of our city. And thank you for the, the presentation and detail um, you provided I'm, for us today. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Matt Stegman uh, from the Mayor's Office. I, I believe the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice has their oh, hearing at you know, 4 o'clock. You're right. I'm sorry. I was. I was um, I think I've received so many emails and, and re response to the police department. Also, all I have on my mind. So you're, you're I mean, I, I, su I suppose if the committee is uh, so happy with MSCJ that they don't need to hear anything, we'd be happy to send everybody home. But uh, no, we, we are never <laughs> that happy with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I say thank you. Thank you for recessing. <laughs> so so, so we, we will recess this hearing until four o'clock when we'll have the mayor's office of criminal justice. Thank you so much, Matt, for catching me on that. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Right. Thank you. Take care.